Welcome to Visiting the Invisible, a tour of Berlin that is different in two ways. First is virtual, so instead of walking through the town, you'll see seven clips and in between the clips you'll get the chance to ask questions. Second, I'm not going to take you to the normal sites of Berlin, but instead I'm going to show you some normal residential houses in Kreuzberg and the stories they have to tell about financialization and anonymous investments. We start our tour on Potsdamer Platz, not because it has beautiful historical buildings, actually everything around here, nearly everything was built quite recently, but because it's a perfect playground for international financial markets. Before we start our tour though, I want to show you a few numbers. If you look at those numbers, there are two things that you can see. First of all, real estate is really big. Around the world, real estate makes up half or even more of the national wealth. In Berlin, that's 500 to 700 billion euros worth of bricks, mortar and especially land that you find. Second, it, there's not just one real estate market. Actually, there's a commercial real estate market that has usually big and very frequent transactions and that is dominated by the international financial market investors. And second, there's a more traditional residential real estate market. So think couples buying an apartment uh, for the rest of their lives, doctors buying a house to invest for their retirement. So many, but very small transactions and usually long time spans of investment. And in between those two, and that's going to be the focus today. There's financialized residential real estate, meaning several houses being packed up in packages and sold and traded and speculated, just like you would see it in the commercial real estate markets. So let's start our tour. Imagine you're standing at the crossroads of Potsdamer Platz, facing south around six o'clock. Take a turn to the right between seven and nine o'clock you will see the Akan, a complex of shopping centers, offices, even a cinema. And this whole complex was bought by Brookfield in 2016 for about 1.4 billion euros. And at the moment it's worth approximately 1.7 billion. Now in this complex of the Arcade, you can see the international financial markets at its best. But to see that, we we'll have to go to the Luxembourg Trade Registry. Luckily for us, it's completely virtual and free. So let's go there. If you type Potsdamer Platz in the Luxembourg Corporate Register, you will get a list of results and all of those are companies, which means the Arcaden complex was packed up into small corporate shells, which makes it much easier in the future to sell those companies. So if you want to um, sell a part of the Arcaden in the future, if Brookfield decides to sell, all they have to do is to sell shares in those Luxembourg companies. They don't have to go to the notary in Germany. And most of all, they don't have to pay transaction tax real estate transaction tax, which is 6% of the transaction value in Berlin. Those are the so-called share deals um, that make it much easier for investors to speculate because they save at each step of the transaction this um, transaction tax. And what you can also see in the corporate register in Luxembourg is the financials. And if you look at the financials of, uh, of Brookfield, you can go down here to the Consolidated accounts of 2018, you find the value of the current value of the buildings that I told you before, that was 1.7 billion. You find the rent income and you also find the expenses and the profits and the taxes that they pay. And what you usually see with these kind of companies of the international financial markets, they are housed in Luxembourg without much of employees, owned by a partnership from the Cayman Islands. A tax haven is in the, in the Pacific, close to the US. And they shift a lot of money, interest money. In this case, it's about 24 million out of the 62 million of rent income 
from Germany via Luxembourg to the Cayman Islands again to save tax. After this short excursion to the Luxembourg Corporate Registry, let's get back to the middle of Potsdam Airplanes. If you continue turning between 10 and 12 o'clock, you see the Sony Center. It's another prime example of the international financial markets at play. It was sold first in 2010 to the Korean pension fund for around 600 million. Seven years later, it increased in value by 500 million euros when it was sold to investors again from Canada and the US and again as a share deal. So no tax was paid on that transaction. Now, if you continue trading at about two o'clock, slightly hidden behind the construction site, you'll see the Mall of Berlin. At the time of its construction in 2014, 2015, it was also actually called the Mall of Shame because it was built by Romanians that allegedly worked for six euros per hour for a subcontractor and in the end weren't even paid this salary that is uh, not even legal in Germany because the subcontractor went bankrupt. And this subcontractor again in turn worked for a very famous German project developer that builds um, shopping centers around Berlin and around Germany. And he is not the owner of the building at the moment. Very soon, with money from the Bavarian pension insurance, he sold the building to the to Arab Investments Limited, an investment company from the UK that again has investors from around the world, probably most probably from the Arab world, um, that we don't know. So anonymous investors behind Arab Investments Limited that own this Mall of Berlin. And up on top of the Mall of Berlin, you will see some residential houses, actually one of the few places uh, to live here around Potsdamer Platz, at least if you can afford about 5,000 euros of rent per month. So you can see here uh, what you can get for this uh, 5,000 euros a month. You'll get a very nice um, inward facing uh, and very big and comfortable apartment. Let's end our tour of Potsdamer Platz with one of the last construction sites here. And what's remarkable in this construction site, maybe you've seen it before, is the sign of names that usually goes with a construction site. What is usually missing in this big list of names is the name of the owner. In this case, we're actually lucky. There's a company called F100 and Freo that you can see here. If you go to their website, you'll actually find your way to the owner that is an investment company from Switzerland. But there's a problem. Switzerland is a secrecy jurisdiction, so ownership in Switzerland is not very transparent. Luckily, in this case, the ownership goes through Luxembourg and Luxembourg is obliged to tell us the final owners of each of the companies that is registered there. And there's, since 2019, a new register that's called the Beneficial Ownership Register. And uh, before we end our tour, let's have a very quick look um, what this beneficial ownership register tells us. You will see here the names of the final owners of this construction site in the middle of Potsdamer Platz. It's a guy called uh, Julius Beer. There's a bank and a banking family in Switzerland called it this, but uh, I haven't found the son with this birth date and this um, also birth town that is stated in the register related to that family. So either until now I don't know who is the owner, and we can only we don't can only suspect that he owns the building through, through several foundations or other construction in Switzerland. So only medium helpful. And one last thing about this uh, sign of names, what you can also not see is the consultant that uh, the company hired when they were trying to get the building permit in the site. Um, they hired a former SPD city councillor that was responsible for um, construction and city planning. And they managed with the help of this advisor to be allowed not to build any um, flats, any houses for living, as it was usually 
necessary, usually foreseen in their planning, um, but they could only build offices that usually create a bigger profit for them. On our way to Kreuzberg, let's have a short stop at Checkpoint Charlie and join the other tourists. You've probably heard of the historical dispute between the US and the Russians here at this point, and you've probably seen pictures or in real the guards that guarded the free world at this point. There is a more recent dispute here that involves the construction on the former eastern side, the former Russian side um, of Berlin here of Checkpoint Chal. And it has on one side the investor called Trockland that wants to build a hydro hotel, an underground museum and several other buildings here and the city of Berlin and some noisy architects who want more open space and a more prominent place for the museum. Funny enough, on the side of the investors, there is again a Russian involved. And the finance manager of Trockland is a, for, is a Russian banker. And he's also the, the son-in-law of the deceased Turkmen dictator that had a reputation for stealing a lot of money from the Turkmenish gas resources. A little further behind, a little off the beaten track of the tourists, you can actually see one of the developments of Trockland um, that has already taken shape. And even though it's not my cup of tea, I would say the aesthetical value of this construction is a bit dubious. But what is more dubious is actually the partners that have invested here. This time you find them actually in the German trade register which unfortunately, unlike the Luxembourgish, is not as virtual and not as free. But I downloaded the list of shareholders for you. And if you have a look inside, you'll see it in this one and also in other, uh, other Trotland investments around Berlin. You'll see anonymous structures, like for example, gold leaves from Liechtenstein. You'll see Vladimir Sokolov, the Russian banker that I've talked about. And you see the family of the late Turkmen dictator, his wife, his probably the widow, um, her daughter and her great grandchildren that all own shares in companies that own investments of Trotland throughout the city. And there's been a debate about that um, in the city. We are now entering Kreuzberg and arriving at Hallisches Tor. In front of you, you see Mehringplatz, and it's surrounded by the typical cost-saving post-war um, architecture. The square Mehringplatz was actually named after a Marxist historian called Franz Mehring, who was also a politician of the Social Democrats. And actually the headquarters of today's Social Democrat Party is just a stone throw from here. The eastern side of Mehringplatz is owned by the city of Berlin and the social housing, and we're going to have a closer look at the western side. Tenants here have complained about rotting basements, unresponsive managers, and drug dealers openly going about their business just a few steps away from the headquarters of the Social Democrat Party. And they have called for help from the city or the council, the administration of Kreuzberg. The buildings around here are owned by a company called SAF Select Evolution One. And it took a bit more research to find out who's behind that company. You can see it here in the picture. On the top, it's an investment fund called Optimum Evolution. It's based, as most investment funds are, in Luxembourg. The managers are Italians, with a link to Malta. And the investors are unknown, even though, despite the beneficial ownership register in Luxembourg. Because none of them owns more than 25%, which would qualify them to enter in this beneficial ownership register. So that's a typical picture of investment funds. If you're an investor in an investment fund, you usually own 5-10% of the investment fund 
and you never appear in the beneficial ownership register. So that means the only person who knows about the investor is the investment manager, in this case, the Italian guy based in Malta. And considering the stories we've heard about Malta, at least I would have some doubts about who those investors could be. Now, as we know, for the Luxembourg companies, we can have a look in the corporate register and have a look at the perspective of the investors. From their perspective, the fund is in the optimization phase. The value of the buildings is increasing. It actually increased by more than 100 million euros last year. And the rents are being optimized, which from the point of the investor means rising. I would say that's in stark contrast to what the tenants tell us and what the tenants tell us of this building. But that's the way it is. Just a few minutes from Hallische Store, there's Zosner Straße, a very unremarkable street in the middle of Kreuzberg. And on the side, it's Zosner Straße number 16, a very unremarkable house owned by another investment fund from the international financial markets. This time it's Blackstone, one of the biggest real estate investors in the world, based in the US. And like any international financial markets investor, or like most of them, and as a typical international financial markets investor, Blackstone's companies are based in Luxembourg and in the Cayman Islands. They bought the house through a share deal, which means they didn't pay tax. They shift their profits with a loan from Germany via Luxembourg to the Cayman Islands. They pay out huge management fees. Actually, the owner of Blackstone, the founder of Blackstone, Mr. Schwarzman, made 500 million Euro, US dollars in 2019 from its management of assets. And the investors stay completely anonymous. What Blackstone does to the city and to the tenants becomes clear if you look just across the street. Zosner Straße number five with a remarkable colorful facade was bought by its tenants in 1978 when houses were still rather affordable in Berlin for 200,000 Deutsche Mark at that time. After the loans were repaid, there was enough money to invest in a nice renovation and this is where this colorful facade came, comes from. And by now, the houses are owned by the individual residents and their children and there's no rent that they have to pay anymore. Just a few blocks down at number 48, there's a more recent uh, effort to get the house, a group of um, tenants there bought their house from the hands of an investor in 2016 with the help of Mietshäuser Syndicate, um, a cooperative that is trying to help tenants to buy their houses around Germany. And even though they have to pay uh, the loans for the house that wasn't as cheap anymore as the, the house we saw at number five, and even though they have to pay fees to Mietshäuser Syndicate and the, and the people that um, bought the land for them, and they still manage to maintain their rents at somewhere between 6 and 8 euros, which is in stark contrast to the House of Blackstone, that is in the optimization phase, which means rents are increasing. Um, and we've seen examples of apartments in this building being um, advertised for 16 euros and more. We know from tenants paying 11 euros and above um, for their apartments there, even though they're just across the street of the other house, where the rents are still kept at six to eight euros per square meter. So that's, I think, a, a very nice example. Uh, just here in the street, so close to each other, different models of owning real estate um, and very visible um, how international financial investors increase rents, extract profits from the tenants um, in the city and are not the only investors that can take good care of the houses. For our last three stops, we leave big finance and enter the world of the wealthy individual real estate investors. Imagine now you're standing at the crossroads of Diefenbachstraße and Krefestraße, 
looking at the old trees around, many of them, as well as the houses, have been around for decades. But in the recent past, several very glitzy owners have come and gone. One of them is Mr. Tecker, a multimillionaire from Denmark. Just before the financial crisis, he started to buy up several houses around here. And in good times, he owned more than 3,000 apartments around Berlin. But after the financial crisis, he sold them off piece by piece and now owns only a few dozen, as well as some commercial real estate here in Kreuzberg as well. And one of the apartments that stayed until very, very recently in the end was just here at one of the corners where he split up the house in individual condominiums, sold them very expensively and kept just one for his kids when they came to party and for himself probably. And I was visiting the apartment when it was supposed to be sold off for 8,000 euros per square meter. That was not a fancy apartment at all. And it was probably bought at 1,000 euros a square meter or something in, in that magnitude. So Mr. Tecker was trying to extract seven times his investment from this individual apartment in just a few years. Another company that was doing exactly the same around here and is still actively doing that, splitting up apartments, selling them as expensive investments to individuals, is Lebensgut. They use something of an anonymity made in Germany, as I would call it. So they use an Aktiengesellschaft, that is a special form of a joint stock company that has one big advantage. Unlike with a normal limited company, the shareholders don't have to register in the normal company register. Instead, they register in the internal register of the Aktiengesellschaft that is not accessible to the public. Thanks to the beneficial ownership register, now any shareholder, even in the Aktiengesellschaft that owns more than 25%, has to register. But in this case, instead of the real owner, there was a lawyer that didn't seem to be able to own this amount of real estate. So we checked a bit further. We went and combed through old company documents and found some links to a real estate professional, prominent real estate professional here from Berlin, Mr. Ziegert. And together with the Berliner Zeitung confronted him and asked him whether he has anything to do with this company. Faced with the public pressure, he quickly admitted that it was him. He said that the wrong entry in the beneficial ownership register was an unfortunate mistake that he would correct immediately, but that he had opted for anonymity because otherwise he would pay just for his name a higher price for the buildings he was trying to buy. So we checked even further and checked a lot of other companies that own real estate in Berlin in our study of the beneficial ownership register and found that the mistake that Mr. Ziegert made was not just one example, but pointing to a systematic failure of the information contained in the beneficial ownership register. And hopefully this study that we just published a few weeks ago is going to help um, to change that so that in future, when you look in the beneficial ownership register, you can actually rely on that information. Stop number six is Oranienstraße 25. And maybe another house that might be losing its anonymity as we speak. One of its residents is the bookstore Kish and Co. And they were already facing eviction by a previous owner, Mr. Beck, who uh, three years ago, and are now threatened to lose their rental contract to the new owner that just bought their house. And they're fighting like they did three years ago, tooth and nail, and with the support of the community around them against this eviction. And one thing they did was try to find the owner that they were dealing with. So on the communication they would receive, they always get letters from a Berlin law firm 
And in the register, when they look at, they find a Luxembourg company, like in so many cases, that leads them to an investment company from the UK. But the company in Luxembourg, just like the Aktiengesellschaft in the previous example, is a special company made for anonymity. The investors or shareholders, just like in the example of the Aktiengesellschaft, of this so-called SCSP, don't have to register in the traditional register in Luxembourg, like normal companies in Luxembourg do, but instead only are known internally. And again, the beneficial ownership register is supposed to change that situation. But just like in the German case of, uh, of Lebensgut, the beneficial ownership register doesn't contain the final beneficial owner, but instead contains three lawyers from Liechtenstein that are working according to the register as trustees on behalf of some final beneficial owner. In this case, we did an internet search with the three names of the lawyers and found them appearing several times in connection to a Swedish family called the Rausing family. These are some heirs that inherited several billion euros um, worth of assets from the founder of the Tetra Pak company, their father or grandfather, and are now working mainly as philanthropists, um, so spending the money that uh, they inherited and that they make from their investments on, uh, on a good purpose. We confronted them together with the press again. We don't have the final confirmation that it's really them and can until then only suppose that it's them. But we're still hoping that once they realize uh, who or what the money is doing in their name in Berlin and what their managers are doing on their behalf, they will change their mind and not evict the bookstore and realize that Doing good with money earned in a bad way doesn't make a lot of sense. The final stop of our tour takes us to the northeastern corner of Kreuzberg, or if you wish, to a very sunny but very dark corner of the global financial markets. This rather unremarkable house might have a very remarkable story to tell, but unfortunately it's not allowed to talk. The owner of the house like in so many cases of our tour today, is a company in Luxembourg. But this company is not owned by one of the big investment companies from the US or Canada, but instead managed by a small investment manager from the UK. And the owner shifted from Jersey in 2000, where it was initially registered in 2007, to the Seychelles in 2013, which is one of the most secretive, most difficultly accessible countries in this world and one of the Berlin prosecutors once um, just last year said in a, in a public speech that anyone who owns a company or owns a, Ger a Berlin house through such a structure is completely out of reach of the law because if a prosecutor tries to obtain information on the owners in the Seychelles, usually he doesn't receive any answer. So look at the house here in the middle, in the corner of Kreuzberg and look at the address where the owners are registered just across the central term, the marina, many, many thousand kilometers away. And with this picture, we'll end our tour of the financial markets and anonymity. And I hope that when in future you pass by a house, you do not only marvel at the architectural features or the need of repair, ponder the lives of the residents, but also sometimes wonder about the tales of economic injustice, financial crime, or fruitful human cooperation that it might be able to tell us. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy very.